Welcome to the third Food for Thought lecture series for the calendar year 2021. This lecture series has been a valued community tradition of Trinity University for more than 30 years. Tonight's discussion is brought to you by Trinity University Alumni Relations and Development Division and the Office of Special Events as part of Trinity's commitment to lifelong learning. I am Olivia Royball, class of 2019. I grew up in Georgetown, Texas and graduated from Trinity University with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Environmental Studies. During my time at Trinity, I was a member of Alpha Chi Lambda, Trinity Progressives, and the Coalition for Sexual Justice. I was also a member of Dr. Lyons Research Lab for three years. I currently live and work in San Antonio. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Kelly Lyons. Dr. Lyons is a professor in the biology department at Trinity University. She is a botanist and ecologist who studies the influence of diversity on ecosystem functioning and invasive species dynamics. Her current research focus is on restoration of Texas grasslands and rangelands with emphasis on improving soil health. Dr. Lyons was a Fulbright scholar in Sonora, Mexico. Her research was supported by awards from the National uh, Science Foundation, US Department of Agriculture, and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, among others. She teaches a range of biology courses at Trinity, as well as study abroad courses in Latin America and China. Dr. Lyons currently serves as the director of the McNair Scholars Program at Trinity. In addition, she is president of the board of directors for the Texas chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration and former board president of Friends of San Antonio Natural Areas. She also serves as associate editor for the Weed Science Society of America journal, Invasive Plant Sciences and Management. Beyond Dr. Lyons' academic and professional accomplishments, she is a mentor and friend to her students. I first met Dr. Lyons when she was one of my professors in my first year experience class, Global Climate Change. The class captivated my interest and it is why I decided I wanted to learn as much as about environmental science and biology as I could. I took classes with Dr. Lyons, studied abroad with her in Cuba, Cuba, and conducted research throughout my four years at Trinity. We have published one collaborative paper this year in the journal Fungal Ecology, and are currently working on a paper featuring um, the best growing practices for native Texas milkweed species. Dr. Lyons is a compassionate mentor, colleague, and friend. She actively works to increase the representation of women and minorities in biology and restoration ecology. I have seen firsthand how she meets her students' uncertainty and struggles with encouragement, support, and empathy. At the end of the lecture, we will host a Q&A session. You will be able to submit your questions at any time during this presentation using the Q&A tab. The questions will be summarized and I will submit as many as I can to Professor Lyons. Thank you and now please welcome Professor Kelly Lyons. Olivia, thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate that. It's always such an, an honor to uh, be honored in that way by your students when they leave. And I am so lucky to, I get to see so many fantastic students go through Trinity and then go off into the world and do their own things, um, often with the influences, my influences, but they influence me just as much as I influence them. Thank you so much, Olivia. I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate the alumni office Office of Alumni Relations for inviting me to give this talk. It's a real honor. Um, I would, of course, prefer to do it in person. And uh, this is a, a new challenge for me, giving a talk to an audience of, of zero, basically. So I, uh, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of people there, but I can't really see how many, who, you're, who you are, who you're fake. I can't see your faces. So I'll do my best to keep this interactive um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So um, Olivia gave a really nice background to, to my um, to my life and my uh, profession. Um, and I just wanted to add that I, I am very, I'm trained in both the liberal arts and the sciences. And, um, and this is something that I've brought to Trinity and one of the reasons why I feel like Trinity has been a really good match for me. Um, and so over the years, I have become more and more of a, moved more and more away from theoretical ecology, more to restoration ecology. Um, and I mostly specialize in grasslands. But um, this is a real rare opportunity for me to get to talk about conservation biology in this context. So I, I sort of set a challenge for myself with this talk. I've never given a talk of this type. I've ta taught a lot about conservation biology, but really trying to, to uh, get out there and, and outline what is happening in conservation that's new and important and moving into diversity, equity, inclusion issues. Um, the sciences tend to be a little bit behind in these, these arenas. Um, so 
I set it as a challenge for myself to talk a little bit more about what's happening and the cutting edge of, of conservation um, in a lot of different ways, but in one way that's very important is diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm going to share my, my talk here now. All right. change the slides. So the objectives for this talk are to talk about the antecedents and the new directions that we're going in um, with conservation biology. Um, I also want to give you guys an idea of how I teach conservation biology. So this is one of the most depressing uh, fields, the uh, most depressing subjects really you can talk about. Um, and so what I often do in my class is I talk about problems and then I also talk about solutions. Um, so every problem I present, you know, like the wolf problem or the reintroduction of wolves and then, okay, what are the solutions there? How can people get along better and make better decisions about the reintroduction of the wolf? Um, and then I want to give you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to teach in the COVID-19 environment. I'm sure a lot of you have taken webinars and kind of get what this is like, but trying to keep these things more interactive um, when you can't be person in person um, is a real challenge. It's been kind of a fun challenge for many of us. Um, so I'm going to start out by briefly defining some terms and do a brief survey with you um, and, and uh, show you the Poll Everywhere system. Many of you probably use that. I also want to talk about the antecedents to conservation biology. Uh, a lot of us are familiar with these. And it's interesting that I'm giving this talk to a lot of people who don't know a lot about conservation biology. And then I understand that some of my close colleagues are here, perhaps um, from things like um, Texas Parks and Wildlife. So the antecedents will be um, something that a lot of you know about. Um, but then I'll move into contemporary solutions and strategies. Um, and then we'll do a Q&A session after that. All right. So the first important terms to get straight is the difference between preservation and conservation. So Preservation generally is reserved for thinking about things that are untouched, where there's no human development or no human use or no to little to no management of those systems. And conservation is kind of a very broad term, actually. Um, it can be used to refer to wise use. So we use the landscape or we re, uh, extract resources, but we do it wisely in a sustainable way or in a responsible way or in a way that manages the integrity of the natural landscape. Now, that can be done with like resource extraction in mind, you can imagine like you can lay down pipe for uh, fracking in a very, very sustainable way that pays attention to what you do with the topsoil, which seeds you put back in. Uh, are you putting back native species? Are you revegetating with exotic species? Those kinds of things. There's lots of ways to do resource extraction that are conservation minded. Um, you can also do conservation of, of natural parks, right? Um, or the national park system so that you may, your goal may be to conserve um, something that has already been disturbed, right? Um, but to keep it into conservation, or it could be multi-use. You could be, you know, extracting and conserving, um, or you could just be doing extraction in a very sustainable way. So there's lots of lots of um, room for moving between these uh, terms. But preservation is generally a highly restricted term. The other term that's terms that I'll be using are ecosystem functioning and ecosystem services. So we generally think of ecosystem services as those things that these ecosystems provide for us. So for example, my favorite side part of this wheel is on the left side over here where you have cooling temperature or flood control. We have erosion control as well, uh, water purification, storage of carbon, which is we're getting really into right with um, storage of carbon in whether it's above ground and plant biomass or below ground and soils, um, storing carbon is going to be really important because that's where the CO2 is going to go cleaning air, right? The, the more high functioning your ecosystems are, generally the more diverse they are, the better they're going to keep your air clean. Same with just biomass in general. Most systems that have higher diversity where most of the species are intact, you're going to have higher biomass. Um, so anyway, we often talk about that systems will function in a certain way. There's high ecosystem functioning, and that is generally related to the services that they provide to humans. So services are generally just applied to humans. All right, so the next term is a little bit more difficult, um, intrinsic value. So we have intrinsic worth that we place on things in our lives or things in um, ecosystems. Um, and we there are some things that we diminish in value. Um, and to sort of drive this point home, we're going to do a brief survey. Um, so one of the things I failed to do was tell you guys the top, sorry, I can't see the top of this slide, so this is a big error on my part. You need to get um, the paper and pen and paper handy, and or you can just open up this website, pollev.com, and go to type in Lions Kelly 863, and this will allow you to engage in the poll. Now, when I get into the poll, you'll be able to see this website as well, so it won't be um, the last time you see it. So I'm going to move forward to this survey. So I want to do a survey for you just to drive home this idea of intrinsic worth. 
or intrinsic value. Um, I have a bunch of things here that are of, of various value to us. Um, I have a rock, an alien, a human infant, a human fetus, a human adult, a giant sequoia, uh, elephant, squid, cockroach, or water. And what I want you to do is log into this poll and tell me, here's the poll, um, which one of these you would rank as number one on your list in value. I'll give people a little more time on this one because I know that you're going to have to log into this website. I am having trouble seeing any chats, so um, my crew, if you guys can text me if there's any problems, please. Okay, so far I have 13 people. Okay, let's see what people answered here. Okay, so water is number one. So most people chose water. Now it's going to start changing as the um, responses come in. Sequoia. Somebody has a lot of value for sequoia. Okay, good. So we've got plenty of people coming in. Okay, good. So let's look at the next question. Which item among these is ranked last on your list? If anybody's joined late, you can log into pollev.com and you enter my name, lionskelly863, and then you can engage in the poll. Okay, let's see what we have here. No. Oh, cockroach. So people have <laughs> cockroach very low on their list, below rock. Okay, and alien is below. Alien is at the bottom, right? We don't know what aliens are. What are they? Okay, a few more questions for you, just for fun. Um, a rock has worth. Yes, no, or maybe it depends. Okay, let's see. So a rock has worth. And maybe it depends. How about a tree has worth? Yes, a lot of people think trees have worth. And finally, the universe has worth. Okay, so these, may, no. so these may seem like really silly questions, right? But they're the questions that faced us philosophically. And so I've given you all these uh, pictures of these really nice, beautiful things on the planet, right? Um, even that rock is really pretty, and this is a nice looking alien. But what if I showed you pictures like this of things, right? They get a little bit different perspective, like maybe if the tree's falling on your house or the elephant scratching itself on your car, or maybe it's a really magnificent rock, right? That's just so much larger than us. Or what if the cockroaches look like this? Or what if the rock really loved rocks, right? So it really can depend on the intrinsic value of things and how you perceive them, your perspective, which where you're coming from. And so, um, so we, we have some questions here we have to address, right? We have critical questions and arguments that have to be addressed by con or are addressed in conservation. We don't always get the answers, but, but they're things that we ask. And some of this gets very, very philosophical, of course. So if we value the universe, then how can we not value all of the things in it? If we are an extension of the universe, then the well-being of the universe is critical to our own well-being. We are self-designated stewards of life on Earth. This used to be a question, but now it's becoming pretty clear that this is a reality. Can we protect or preserve everything? And if not, 
How do we choose? How do we address different belief or valuation systems across the planet? And then the last one is, is this talk an existential crisis in the making? And if you're like me, of course it is. <laughs> this is a very existentially jarring uh, topic, of course. Okay, so conservation biology is not a new field. Well, it's a relatively new field, like relative to philosophy, but um, it's been around for, um, you know, probably, I guess you could say, solidly 100 years. Um, and there have been really good books written for use in, um, in academia for teaching conservation biology. These I'm just showing you two here that are really terrific um, books. I've used both of these. I've also used Peter Kariva's book, Conservation Science, which gets more into the, the details of how to do conservation science. Um, it's a much more technical book. Um, so, but these books generally start with the with the antecedents, all the what, we, what uh, my one of my favorite colleagues, Greg Hazelton, refers to as men on mountains, right? All of the people who established the field of conservation biology and wildlife management, for that matter. Um, but a new book came out just recently by Dorsetta Taylor um, on the rise of the American conservation movement, more focused on power, privilege, and environmental protection as it pertains to um, people who are missed, um, women. Um, people of color, all that sort of thing, sort of not only the people who really have made a big difference, but also the supporting cast that has been missed. So I'm going to talk about the antecedents of conservation biology, um, any, like you could find in the first couple of chapters of these books. And then I'm going to, I'm going to look at Dorsetta Taylor's book uh, later on in the talk and talk about that. Okay, so this is a list of just a lot of the, a lot of the standard players who we talk about um, in conservation biology. Um, they are all very influential in my life in one way or another, of course. Uh, some of them are, you know, terrific natural historians, or like you look at somebody like Grinnell, who actually has had a major influence on um, ecology. And you look at Lyell, Wallace, and Darwin, of course, these three guys together helped establish the field of, of evolutionary biology. Um, Darwin, of course, gets credited for most of that, but Lyell is, was a geologist who influenced not only Wallace, but also von Humboldt. Um, and, um, he also, Darwin, he, Lyell influenced Wallace, Darwin, Humboldt, and a bunch of other people as well. But I'm going to talk, um, excuse me, today mostly about these in blue. So Von Humboldt, um, Lewis and Clark, Thoreau, Muir, and Leopold. And these first two right here I'm going to talk about primarily because um, books have come out recently about them that are just totally fascinating and, and everybody should read. And these other three you really can't avoid, so I just want to speak briefly about them. So the first one is von Humboldt. This is a book that's phenomenal if you haven't read it and you really are interested in um, in biogeography and conservation biology. Uh, this is kind of our ecology, any of those things. This it was a terrific read. Uh, von Humboldt's a, a fascinating character. He was a prolific writer. He was a traveler. He observed all the time. He was just constantly engaged. He was also in, um, like I said, he was very good, close with Goethe, and um, and they debated a lot about the natural world. He was an experimenter as well. It's, it's become relatively clear that he was likely um, gay and that he liked he really preferred to spend most of his time in Paris, but, um, but he was stuck spending a lot of time in Prussia, which he really disliked. Um, so he had a lot of strong words to say also about what was happening in the world as far as the treatment of slaver, slaves. She, he spent a lot of time in Cuba and in Latin America and uh, wrote, wrote prolifically about that as well. Um, this, is a, this is a map of his travels. He, Spent quite a bit of time in, in excuse me, in South America and the um, rivers of this this area. He also spent time in Mexico City and Cuba, like I said, Cuba and a lot of this area, and had a lot to say about the slave trades in those areas. Um, he spent some time in Washington, and um, he and Jefferson really hit it off. Um, he's a fascinating character because. He made these major contributions to our understanding about how plants and animals are distributed in the world. His biggest contribution is really this one and depicted in this map that he drew these beautiful maps of these mountains that he climbed um, and that he could connect what happened elevationally. So as you go from lower elevations to higher elevations, you have plants that tolerate are more tolerant of colder climates, right? So as they go up, usually thinner soils, colder climates, those kinds of things. So the, the whole environment changes as you go from lower elevation to higher elevation. In the same way, you see these changes in when you go from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. So if you start in the equator and you go north or start at the equator and you go south, you see the same sorts of changes in distributions of species. And he connected these by going up many mountains and then connecting that to the latitudinal changes that he saw. 
And he was able to, to demonstrate that this is a biogeographic pattern that you see across the planet, and it's very consistent. And he was, he was laborious. He traveled with a terrific um, botanist called Bonplan, um, who did the drawings for his books. He was uh, incredibly, incredibly successful. Um, so not enough can be said about him. The next thing I want to talk about briefly is Lewis and Clark Expedition. This book really changed my whole perception of um, early American uh, exploration. It is a phenomenal text, and um, it, tra it tracks the trips, uh, the trip of Lewis and Clark going from St. Louis and all the things that they had to do to get ready for that trip, going basically upstream, <laughs> paddling, and portaging a ton um, up the Missouri River to Fort Mandan, and then, of course, across um, to the west to the Pacific Ocean. This was the first time um, anybody had done this. Now, this whole area was, of course, full of Native Americans who had probably done the same thing and discovered a lot of the same, same discovered things. Um, and, of course, it was also full of fur trappers, um, French and British and otherwise. Um, and, and, of course, I'll talk about Sacagawea in a minute, but, um, but what was really struck me about the book was how much of the ecosystems were intact, just the, the sheer number of, of ungulates and bu buffalo and fish, and it was just endless amounts of biodiversity. Um, and and then by that point, there had already been pretty big um, run on buffalo and beaver to that. Beaver were, you know, already kind of going, going being extirpated in lots of areas of the United States by that point. Um, so it's a phenomenal story. I highly recommend um, that you read that text. It is it, My students don't like when I assign it because it's 600 pages, but it's a really great read. Okay, and then no, no talk on antecedents is uh, complete without some mention of, of uh, the next two people. So Thoreau, of course, he was um, a terrific philosopher. And um, if you, I find Walden a little tedious, but there are all these nuggets, beautiful nuggets in that book that you just can't get around. Um, he, he went to the woods because he wanted to live there and experience the woods. This quote that I have, the first quote I have, um, if you read the complete quote, he talks about how if the if nature is mean, then I want all of the meanness that it has to dish out. <laughs> so he just really wanted to experience um, nature in, in all of its glory. Um, some people are critical that he wasn't actually that isolated. It turns out there were a lot of actually Native Americans living on the pond, the, on the uh, lake with him. He saw friends. Some people say he brought his laundry home. I don't really know all the details of that. But um, but I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about not how not he was not only a, a really important philosopher um, and contributor to conservation biology, but he was also a really terrific natural historian and ecologist. Um, okay, and then John Muir, of course, is a, a really important person to talk about. He One of the things I want to mention is that he walked very long distances, and I'm going to talk later about how there were also other people who walked long distances, maybe even longer than him, that didn't get much credit for it, but um, he was a very, very deeply religious person. He wanted to be out in nature alone. He did things like climb up trees and experience what trees experienced in thunderstorms dangerously. Um, he also was very, became buddies to some degree with uh, Roosevelt and convinced Roosevelt that the national park system needed to be created to protect Yosemite. And of course, Yellowstone came first, but, um, but he was very, very instrumental in all of that. A really phenomenal human and reading his works, of course, is, is a fun and a joy. Then, um, Aldo Leopold, probably my favorite. Um, he's he is much later than these guys and started what we call the land ethic. What it was really great about Leopold is that he was hired as a young man to hunt and kill wolves and coyotes, all sorts of primary, uh, excuse me, apex predators on the uh, land and throughout the West. And he got to thinking about this very deeply and came to the decision that we were really wrecking the ecosystems by removing those apex predators and that we need to think more deeply about how to manage those ecosystems. He is the person who established basically the study of wildlife management in the United States. He wrote the, the premier textbook on it at the time. He also established the um, go-to program for graduate study in wildlife management. Um, and it's worth reading his what he writes about the land ethic. So he says, if the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And to go along with this, he says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So this is getting back to this ecosystem services that we rely on, that we depend on, and all of that depends on us maintaining and protecting the integrity, stability, beauty of all biological communities or all these ecosystems. 
And that means that we can we keep the ecosystem functioning high in those systems, right? So that they are providing us with the services that we need. So in getting back to this question of, is this talk an existential crisis in the making? One of the most notable quotes from Leopold that I think all the time, because I'm an invasive species specialist, is this one. He says, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And so unfortunately, the more you learn about the world and the more you see intact systems degrade or you see or you know to recognize how to recognize it, degraded ecosystems, um, you do live in a world of wounds. And sometimes it is a world of wound alone. Uh, I, I often tell people, like somebody will say to me, oh, that's such a beautiful field. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's a field of one species of invasive, <laughs> a field of one species and they're all invasive. So, you know, you can't like that, but I should just keep my mouth shut probably most of the time. All right, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about hunting in this talk. Now, this is gonna be a big gap. Um, I personally eat meat in part because I think hunting is so important. Um, so I'm kind of one of the rare ecologists that's not uh, not a not a vegetarian or and I don't eat much meat um, and I'm very careful about what kinds of meat I eat and when I eat it. Um, I do love steak and um, but you know like um, you just need to be I think eat lower on the food chain if you can. So anyway, that's my my um, just statement to the people who um, are vegetarians. But one of the things I think is so important is the history of hunting in this country and how that has made conservation biology work. So you think about the snowy egret that was hunted almost to extinction for its feathers for hats. Um, and then we got really smart about that. And so that was sort of the precursor of the Endangered Species Act. It's a long story about how that grew. But you have things like the duck stamps, uh, right? You have permitting, you have hunting permits, right? People who hunt and people I know who hunt are very, very, knowledgeable about landscapes and they tend to be very close to the ecosystems and they are they tend to be the best advocates for <clears throat> conservation biology now this is notwithstanding this sort of like trophy hunting that's going on with exotic game where you have you know high fences and people are going out that's a whole different deal um but i have to i have to applaud hunters for the what they have brought in the way of conservation biology all right so let's move into contemporary solutions and strategies so the first thing I want to talk about is um, long-term research. I think this is one of the, and since it's my talk, I get to talk about the things that I think are most important to conservation biology. So this long-term research, I think, has been one of the most critical little linchpins in um, our ability to understand what's happening on the planet. Um, this is showing you um, a paper that came out of the Primic Lab. I am so enamored with the Primic Lab. I mean, they have done the most amazing things, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how they've connected um, their research to Thoreau. So Thoreau, it turns out, collected a ton of data on um, when plants did things. So, for example, when they flowered, or when they fruited, or when the leaves turned, or when they broke through the snow, like something like crocus, right? Um, so he went out and recorded every, the day of the year when these things happened for different species over a long period of time. And so, and when Thoreau was writing, this was in the 1800s, right? That's a long time ago. That's almost 200 years ago. That is really good data that we can use to look at how climate change is occurring and how it's affecting species. So this is not Primix work, but this is a really nice figure to show you what, um, what you can do with this data. So there's a lot going on here, so I'll break it down. On this axis right here are the different, spe are different species. So you have maize, which is basically corn, barley, lilac, um, birch, alder, horse chestnut, common dandelions, right? So a lot of species that you know. And then up here, you can see the different things that are happening. Start of flowering, first leaves, um, the first note above the surface of uh, soil, usually that means, um, leaves unfolding, right? So you've got all these different types of what we call phenolo phenological developments or things that occur in plants, things that plants do. With, when, the, when the event is occurring at the regular time, this is looking, this is looking at 30 years of data, okay? This would be, everything would line up on the zero line. When things are happening earlier than we would expect, they fall below the line. So you can see that for the, for the vast majority of the species that were analyzed in this data set, the, the, the plants are doing these things earlier than they were in the past. Okay, and this is because of climate change, because spring is coming earlier, okay? And Primick was able to use, um, to use Thoreau's data to, to establish this. They also use the data to make this figure. 
Um, and this is kind of a complicated phylogeny. What this is is a phylogeny or a relationship, a diagram showing the relationship between different species. And so up here are the lilies, you know lilies, here's orchids, the ranunculaceae, these are buttercups, okay? The onagraceae, um, like Texas type buttercups, what we call buttercups in the rose family. And what they found is that where species are grouped together, basically when they're more related to each other, they're more likely to be in major decline with climate change. Um, and they, again, they were able to connect this to Thoreau's early data, and they were able to look at it on a phylogenetic basis, meaning that they could say that there was some sort of evolutionary restriction on these, these species' ability to adapt with climate change or to, to, to shift with climate change. They weren't as adaptable, and they weren't as, um, they couldn't acclimate as, easy, as easily. Um, so that's just really cool stuff, right? Connecting Thoreau to what's happening now. Now there are also, um, the National Science Foundation supports these long-term ecological research sites, and there are now 28 of these um, throughout the United States. This is showing you a map of all of them here. They all are across the United States. This is a blow up of what's going on in the Northeastern area. There's four of them up there. There's a bunch across Alaska, and there's um, two in Antarctica. These are, these are sites that have been established um, since 1980 by the National Science Foundation. So this is a long time, right? This is like looking at 40 years of data now that we have because we know that we need to be tracking these species longer than the life of a human. Um, and so if we can maintain um, research in these sites um, for a long time, we can collect more information about what's happening. And that's particularly important in the face of climate change. I'm lucky I'm going to get to work on this civilleta right here. This one's in New Mexico in a really beautiful landscape. And then I want to do a shout out to Naomi Oreskes. This is a researcher who um, has looked at, she was really alarmed by um, researchers who were showing up, two of them basically only uh, showing in the legislature and talking about the fact that climate change doesn't exist and that it's not caused by humans. And she decided to go and look at the literature um, as a geologist um, and see what did what did climate change specialists say. She looked at thousands of articles and did meta-analyses and found that not one person, not one researcher found that climate change was not real and not one of them um, disconnected it from the human activities. So um, they all said climate change is real and that's caused by humans. <laughs> and she was able to publish this paper on about the consensus on climate change and then she did a terrific, um, wrote a terrific book and did actually a documentary called Merchants of Doubt about this process. Um, again, this requires long-term data. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is the evaluation of nature, the looking looking for ways to evaluate nature in an intrinsic way, um, or the intrinsic worth of nature. This goes way back to 1972. Um, I was alive at this time, but maybe some of you were. Um, where, I mean, I'm sure it goes back even further, but this is the, this is the document I remember um, most when I was learning about this, was um, this book called Should Trees Have Standing? And it's really a, a humanities focus law legal book on the ethics and morality of of valuing nature by Christopher Stone. Um, this book advocates for the inclusion of nature uh, with inalienable rights in um, in legal documentation, in legal documents. There's also a trend now, uh, an organization that's uh, called the Rights of Nature Organization, and they've been pushing for the inclusion of rights of nature in, again, in legal um, documents. And they have a um, this really nice graphic on their website showing you what's happening in the world. I've put here in dark the initiatives in different countries that are focused on nature. So in Uganda, in the United States, in some rural communities, in some small municip municipalities, um, uh, you have a focus on nature in Mexico, Ecuador, Bolivia, and New Caledonia. These are places where they're actually putting into their constitutions or into their municipal documents um, rights for nature. The ones that are in turquoise are the ones where they have either um, given legal status to rivers or to glaciers. Um, and so, as you can imagine, rivers and glaciers where the water comes from is really important. And this is in India. If you, if you have ever looked at a map of uh, like where, uh, you know, the, the map of the lights of the world, the lights of the, most of the lights that light up in the areas of India are just at the base of the Himalayas or the Himalayas, right? And that's where the glaciers are that then feed water to those people. So it's natural that they would want to um, put, give inalienable rights to those glaciers, right? They're extremely important for providing water for the vast majority of people who live in India. Um, so this is a trend um, that's going on very, very strong in Latin America. Actually, there was a time when um, 
the Nicaraguan constitution was the standard for this, but um, these, stand, these constitutions have gone way beyond. And I want to do a shout out for Gretchen Daly. Dr. Gretchen Daly came to, to Trinity and spoke, gave a lecture, I guess it was about three years ago now, um, on her natural, natural capital project. She um, is a phenomenal, phenomenal conservation biologist. And um, as a matter of fact, she was brought to um, the Vatican to help with the encyclical, to write the encyclical. She works in countries like Bhutan and other countries that are trying to redo their GDP assessments or their gross domestic product assessments to do things like gross national natural capital assessments. You know, how is it that we can assess our well-being through our natural capital? Um, and how do we how do we do those metrics? What do those metrics look like? And there, um, this organization, the Natural Capital Project, gives people tools in order to assess their natural capital value of their ecosystems or their countries or whatever you want to do. You could use it for just a park. And this is an example of an article that came out of, these, of this group that's assessing the ecosystem services that are provided by green infrastructure and golf courses. So this is a golf, these are golf courses that exist in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And um, the Natural Capital Project helps them assess the ecosystem services that are provided um, by those golf courses. So. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to utilize these tools, and um, Gretchen and her team is, is doing an amazing job of moving in very, very novel ways to try to value, put valuations on natural capital. Okay, so I want to see if you guys are still here. <laughs> we still have an audience. Maybe I'm alone now. Um, I want you to answer this question. I want you to name your favorite imperiled, threatened, or an endangered species. It's fine to mention charismatic megafauna. I am a plant biologist, so I won't be offended if you do that. Um, and it can also be a species that's been recovered or assumed to be recovered, like, for example, the brown pelican is now considered a recovered species. So go ahead and uh, join and weigh in. Let me see a couple people. You may, maybe you need a minute to think about it. Okay, let's see what people are saying. Tarantulas, that's a great one. Polar bears, I know, the most sad. Also lots. Texas blind salamanders, that's a great one. Whooping cranes, also terrific. Are they endangered? <laughs> Probably some species. Tigers definitely all over, right? Monarchs. The monarchs were really interesting because and there's been a call for them to be put on the endangered species list, um, and they may very well be as threatened. No gorillas. Apparently, there was a recent finding of some a new population of mountain gorillas that they didn't know about. So there's more than we thought. Okay, these are terrific. We'll let her see how many I have. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, I want you to name a major impediment to preservation of species. Okay, let's see what people are saying here. <laughs> Stupid people. <laughs> yeah, okay. No comment. <laughs> Economic value. They're, if they don't have worth, right? Humans. Ignorance. And plants, ignorance is a big problem, right? A lot of people don't know that much about preserving species, species of plants. Residential development, right? So habitat, destruction, development. Politics, climate change. Great. Great. So what y'all are getting at here is that, um, so you can pick species that are in peril that have a problem. And then you look at the 
impediments to preservation and they're big, broad problems, right? So you have politics, you have global climate change, you have, uh, um, you have growth, right? Just human growth. I mean, the stock market is so tricky for, because human growth is a, I mean, the whole stock market is predicated on growth, right? I'm, I'm invested in the stock market. But I, I recognize that you know, capitalism and, and I am also a capitalist, but capitalism is a problem, right? You have to have growth to have a successful stock market. Well, there's a, there are books written on this. There's a terrific book called um, Growth, Prosperity Without Growth um, that talks about how we can have um, prosperity without a constant growing ecosystem um, or constant growing economy. Uh, but these things are tricky uh, to get your mind around. So my point here is that you have species specific problems and then you have ecosystems that are imperiled. And really what we need to be doing is stepping back and looking at the um, broader, the broader. So that, um, that was something that people realized very early on that while we had the Endangered Species Act and we had, you know, we're protecting egrets or we're going to protect the peregrine falcon or the brown pelican or whatever that was, in the end we had to back up and really protect the ecosystem because these were just canaries in the coal mine. Okay, so one thing that has emerged in the last 10 to 20 years is are these very, very successful ecosystem or watershed approaches. And I'm just going to show one example. And the reason for this, right, is getting back to this um, ecosystem functioning means that we have better services. So watershed management, integrated watershed management has become the standard for any kind of watershed. If you look at the, stand, the San Antonio River uh, Authority, they work with um, the Army Corps of Engineers, the city of San Antonio, Bear County. There's the um, San Antonio River Foundation, which is basically the friends group, right, that does some of the fundraising on the side and a lot of the cultural part of it. Um, these are very, very integrated approaches that involve lots of communication, lots of shareholders, and lots of thinking about all the little parts of the ecosystem. Because San Antonio uses the water, we can pay attention to our headwaters, which is like Breckenridge. But what happens when the water goes downstream down to the Gulf of Mexico? Of course, that has a big effect. If you think about the biggest one of the biggest watersheds in the world, you look at the Mississippi River watershed, it goes all the way to the border of Idaho involves all the, you know, ode to Ohio, then goes all the way down and all that stuff comes down into the Gulf of Mexico, which then has big effects on Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, and what happens to us in June, July, August, when we start to harvest, um, you know, bivalves or fish or whatever it is we're, we're harvesting. So all these things are very connected. So that's become a pretty big standard, integrated watershed management, but also integrated ecosystem management is always a better way to go about preserving and conserving. Um, and then and the same line, just extension of this, is multi-use, multi-stakeholder approaches. And there are lots of good examples of this, um, but I wanted to highlight this one that one of my colleagues, my new colleague, uh, Tomas Urbeck, sent me. He works in, um, in Brazil, and he highlighted this really cool multi-stakeholder, multi-use system um, that is um, Mamirua <laughs> is, is a sustainable de development reserve. And they have an institute, they have a grassroots organization, they've got the anglers there. And now they've um, been able to save this species from extinction by combining con conservation with income gener generation. I think this is going to be the direction of most conservation efforts, especially for species that are have high commodity value, right? So you've got anglers, communities, researchers, governments, NGOs, UNESCO. This is actually considered a World Heritage Site, right? And there's also a national park involved as well. Um, so multiple stakeholders, many different interests have been able to save this species um, from extinction and also maintain a sustainably managed system. It, when I buy fish now, I love eating fish, and I really, one of the places I love to buy fish from the, the most is Iceland, any Icelandic fish, and they do such a good job of managing their ecosystems up there. Um, and so there are some sustainable fisheries for the most part. There aren't sustainable, fish, especially in deep waters, but um, but there are little nuggets of beautiful systems that we are we are doing successfully. Okay, and then the last part of this puzzle is the diversity, equity, inclusion part. So this is our standard list of influencers. Of course, all these guys are white, male, elite, educated, and most of them are very prolific writers and they're very good at self-promoting. So getting to these new books that have come out, I want to talk about each of them individually and about their contributions and hopefully you can pick them up and read them on your own. Um, this rise of the American conservation movement is a little bit dense, but I, I find it really fascinating to read. So what um, Dorsetta Taylor has done is included uh, in her list of, uh, among the list of people who are important in conservation is all the women who have been really important. I mean, they're fascinating women. Um, I added Julia Butterfly Hill, who was not in her book, who I just think is phenomenal. She's the person who tried to save 
um, trees from uh, being cut down for the spotted spotted owl. Um, but basically, there's almost there's been tr tr traditionally no women in these lists. Okay, um, and then she also has extensive information on people of color, and she's also changing the narrative a little bit because one of her points is that there are a lot of people who like Muir and um, and other people who did these long, long walks, um, but didn't get much credit for it. And one of those people is Harriet Tubman. I'll talk about her in a minute. But other people, like Native American Indians, were forced to walk in ways, um, like in the Trail of Tears, that didn't get well documented, or that they, there were Native Americans who knew extensive amounts of uh, information about these landscapes, and they, they really don't get much uh, credit for it. Um, so I wanted to highlight some of the pieces of her book that I think are phenomenal. This this little piece, I didn't realize that Harriet Tubman, I mean, she, we know of her as an activist and we know of her as um, as somebody who was saving the lives of so many um, enslaved people. But what, we, what I, you don't realize is how much she was um, a great natural historian. She was a great orienteer. She was taught by her relatives how to, how to hide well, how to navigate by the stars, how to hide in swamps, how to navigate through swamps and, and go through aquatic habitats so that, you know, the smell uh, of dogs couldn't reach her, um, how to hide at night, um, or how to, excuse me, how to travel during the night and hide during the day. Um, she was a, a really, really terrific natural historian. Um, and there's, uh, this is something I'd love to do. The National Park Service has parks dedicated to the Underground Railroad, and there's now this very cool park system. Um, this is showing you just a piece of it connecting um, basically just north of the Mason-Dixon line all the way up to the border of Delaware uh, and getting into, of course, you need, they needed to get really get people to, uh, to Philadelphia, right, uh, to Pennsylvania to make sure that people were safe and they could get them to eventually to safety. Uh, so it's, she's a she's a phenomenal character and really has gone underappreciated um, as far as the conservation movement is concerned. And then of course Sacagawea uh, is critical and York was the slave of uh, Clark and actually Clark did not even release him until I mean years later I think he finally uh, had to escape but um, neither of these people are given enough credit for all of their work that um, they contributed to the Lewis and Clark expedition. If you read, um, if you read the book, The uh, Undaunted Courage, they are mentioned more than you would expect, um, and they're getting more and more credit for it, but very little is known because they weren't given credit in the journals of Lewis or Clark. And I, I always think about this, this quote that my father, uh, this cartoon that my father told me about years ago, um, that about comparing Fred Astaire and uh, Ginger Rogers and, and this person saying, sure, sh sure, he was great, but don't forget that Ginger Rogers did everything he did backwards and in high heels. And we know that Sacagawea was doing everything that Lewis and Clark were doing with a baby and um, traveling through um, treacherous territory in many times where I'm sure being a woman wasn't that easy, um, not to mention Native American Indian. Okay, so here's another question. i make sure everybody's still here. On a scale of one to five, positive, one being a positive and a five being negative, how would you characterize the relationship between humans and nature? Let's look at the responses. Okay, so the vast majority of you think the relationship is relatively negative. Not 100% negative, but pretty negative, right? It's funny how the answers change when you start showing the responses. Okay, so the, the, the second to last book I want to talk about is this Braiding Sweetgrass book that just has just hit the academy, the academy and the, the, the bookstores. Just It's just taken things by fire. And um, I think it's so successful because because Robin Wall Kimmerer, Kimmerer is a scientist and a Native American Indian. And she is, show, she is showing us what it means to value nature from a Native American perspective in language that, that we all understand. Um, and that, I mean, she just goes back and forth in the use of language in ways that are phenomenal. It is a phenomenally written book. And the basis of her thesis is that Basic Europe, European society that is based in Christianity perceives nature as um, basically something something that is um, negative. It doesn't provide for you, 
and you have to take the resources. And she thinks that this comes from the being banished from the Garden of Eden, right? So you're banished from the Garden of Eden for your sins, and so therefore you need to conquer nature and take what you need. The nature doesn't give to you what you need. Whereas most Native American Indians, if you think about the, and, and I'm, I'm just speaking broadly, um, for North America, um, this turtle, the concept of Turtle Island, which, which is pretty, per, pretty pervasive among um, creation stories for, for Native American Indians, um, Turtle Island provides for its people. It is an interaction between humans and nature, and it is a give and take, as, and it's as much as a give as it is a take, and, um, but it's a provisioning. Uh, so some of the quotes from her book, this one I love, knowing that you love the earth changes you, activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. And she learns a lot about the way Native Americans, her people, um, understand the relationship between themselves and nature using their language. And so she, she finds she has a real catharsis about this uh, because she it works really hard to learn the language that she never learned as a child. Um, and she says in some native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. And she believes that this fundamental perspective has really affected the, our relationship to nature. Okay, and then the last one I want to talk about is this black faces, white spaces in, in which um, in which Carolyn Finney um, is highlighting the absence of African Americans in the great outdoors. Uh, she also she talks a lot about natural, uh, excuse me, the national park system, and um, and why that is. Uh, she goes into. I mean, it's a very it's a very long treatise. It's also very very good. Uh, it's a fun read. Um, but I was really struck by her treatment of of this this character in particular, who I never ever heard about. John Francis. He. Um, he was from California, basically, and he, after he saw the Exxon Valdez spill, he vowed to never use it for two years. He also took a vow of self silence for 17 years, and he walked everywhere. And I can only imagine what it would have been like for an African American or a black man at that time um, in, in our culture to be walking around everywhere and never taking transportation. He ultimately got a PhD, and he did his work in silence. Uh, he only wrote and didn't talk. Um, during his PhD, and he um, ultimately worked in, with the Coast Guard on um, legislation to promote um, good use of, of uh, excuse me, of uh, pra practices or solid, sustainable practices for um, for uh, sorry, I can't think of the words for uh, ships. Thank you, <laughs> ships. And he was ultimately um, a goodwill ambassador for the UN on the environment. Uh, so these are these are really really critical books. They're critical directions that we're going. Um, and uh, there are endless, endless graduate theses on and books written on these white male influencers and conservation biology. And in the next decades, we'll need to pro we'll need to be focusing, and we will be focusing on the more prominent, on the other prominent influences and the supporting casts um, that have influenced uh, conservation biology and, and determined. And this is particularly true if you start looking at um, place. Like I, I've been studying cookbooks that are um, developed on the from the South that are emphasizing the all the products that we have in Southern cuisine that are from the slaves. Ultimately, like you look at the golden rice or um, the use of um, of different kinds of wild uh, wild um, plants and animals um, in Southern cuisine, and these things have not been appreciated as a part of our culture. Um, and so, I'm I'm really happy to see these these new these new trajectories. Okay, so then on that note, I want to thank you so much for attending um, and for supporting Trinity University, and I'll be happy to take any questions at this time. A few more minutes. Okay, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Lyons, for presenting tonight's lecture. Um, as you mentioned, it's now time for the Q&A session. If you haven't already done so, please submit your questions using the Q&A tab. Um, you can also type them directly into the chat if that's more convenient. Um, I'll read out the questions accordingly so that Dr. Lyons can answer them. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
Um, this question uh, is, uh, what do you think are the biggest priorities for conservation in the United States right now? Oh, I mm. maybe just a big one. <laughs> yeah, that's a really big one. <laughs> I just think we have to we're going to have to address climate change. There's just no way around it. I, I think I was thinking I was telling a colleague the other day that in the last two years, I've kind of taken a step back and reevaluated um, what I want to do in my research, because uh, with climate change hitting, I, I know I know what the right questions are. I'm just not sure which directions we need to go. So if you think about like that snowstorm, I mean, are the right questions going to be, it's going to be really dry or it's going to be really hot or it's going to be really, really freaking cold sometimes. <laughs> and um, it's going to be really weird. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. And it's going to be really different. There's a really beautiful word I'll put in the, I don't know if y'all can see this chat, nostalgia. that is um, the, the word suggests that we Things are going to change in ways that make our landscape less familiar to us, and that may that may cause mental health issues. And so, it, dealing with the climate ch effects of climate change on just natural systems is one thing. But I think it, I'm starting to think more and more seriously about what we can grow locally. So, inevitably, petroleum is going to be more expensive. All fossil fuels going to be more expensive with, over time, and. Inevitably, that means that like in places like Texas, we aren't going to be able to import as much or we can import um, ag, produ ag products, but we're going to pay more for them. So I think we need to be paying attention to what can we grow here effectively outdoors and what can we grow effectively in greenhouses. And then in the Netherlands, they're having a really successful time of, of creating greenhouses that are um, very low, uh, low resource use, very low impact. Um, and we can do a lot of that here. We're gonna to have to get smarter and we're gonna to have to do it really fast. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I think that this, the, what do you call it? This snowmageddon or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> uh, that was a real wake up call. I hope it's a wake up call. I'm waiting for these wake up calls. I thought that, you know, Harvey was gonna be enough of one, but we're gonna need a couple of these, I guess, to get serious about it. Um, it seems like it kind of was, cause there's a, it seems like there's a lot of questions about, um, what organizations can we support that are particularly effective either at educating people about uh, restoration biology or effective in taking direct action to improve ecosystems? So a lot of people yeah. are not to get involved. I think, you know, like organizations like Gardopia, I, I direct a lot of money to them. Um, I So lo that's local. So think really local and then think lobbying. <laughs> Seriously, like, okay, think local, do local, and then lobby like a mofo at the federal level, because um, I'm sorry, we're going to have to regulate some of that. We have to, we have to get to the bottom of the regulation part of it. And, and my feeling is, like I said, I'm a, I'm a capitalist. So I really do believe that we can have good companies, but we can't have companies that are like, I don't mind if a company's amoral. Like, let's say a company says, okay, I'm only beholden to my stakeholders. I'm only beholden to the bottom line of making money. That's perfectly fine with me. Like you can do that. You can say, I'm just going to have my money, my, my company make money. But you can't do that and simultaneously, you know, deregulate everything on the other end because you can't have amoral companies making decisions about that. Like, so we need to have like the regulatory end of it, you know, solid and, and not like so much that people can't make money or can't do their business. Like that's something we need to pay attention to. But we have to be very, very careful um, about working both ends of the, of book, bookending this. Okay. Um, Oh, Kay's asking about um, local conservation organizations. So, um, oh boy, Kay put my spot. So, I mean, there's friends, you mean, if really local would be Friends of the San Antonio Natural Areas, they're terrific. Any of the parks, parks organizations, um, the Gardopia, I think those guys are doing great work. Any of those gardening organizations, oh, Ecocentro is doing terrific work. Um, uh, send me an email, I'll make a, <laughs> I'll make a list for you. I, you know, the big organizations like the Nature Conservancy, they do great stuff, but they also can be very shiny in ways that, um, and I love the Nature Conservancy, don't get me wrong, but I really like to go to the small local organizations that are doing things on the ground and educating directly. L Olivia, you should speak up here. Am I missing? <laughs> no, that was a great, a great summary. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so it looks like we're about out of time. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed this evening's presentation. For more information on future webinars and podcasts, please visit trinity.edu forward slash alumni. 
Um, our next Food for Thought lecture is scheduled for April 7th at 5.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, Trinity University Professor uh, Dr. Norma Cantu, along with UTSA uh, Professor uh, Emeritus Dr. Ellen Riojas Clark, uh, class of 74, and art artist Kathy Sosa will be um, will explore revolutionary women of Texas and Mexico. Women are vital to the collective history of Texas and Mexico. If you would like to sign up for the upcoming lecture, uh, please see the registration link in the chat box. Um, thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of all Trinity Tigers, have a great night.